I didn't know if you wanted me to wish you 68 more or not, so I just said many more. So, how wonderful. How wonderful. Oh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, I'll sit down. <laughs> It's not 
every day, you know. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we dry the tears of those who weep and bring hope and comfort to all who mourn. We give you thanks for the peace of Christ and the signs of his sovereignty over life. We cannot hide from your presence, O Holy One. Our needs are all known to you. We are an open book to the one who created us. You have sent Jesus to be our intercessor and redeemer. We give you thanks that through him we can approach you with trust and confidence. We give thanks for your providence and care for creation. You reign supreme in spite of suspicion, destruction, and greed. Implant within us the peace that Christ bestowed upon his frightened disciples. Send us forth in the spirit with wisdom to resolve differences, grace to pray for those who hate us, and vision to strive for harmony in the midst of discord and strife. We give thanks for the forgiveness offered freely to all through Christ's resurrection from the dead. From now on, we can live confident of your grace. Help us to awaken to the assurance of Easter and to be more attuned to the mercy you bestow. Deliver us from bondage to limits both real and imagined, from principalities and powers that seek to crush us. Let the light of Christ dispel the shadows, making bright the pathway you would have us walk. You are the source of our sanctuary, the haven to whom we turn in times of distress. You are the judge of our decisions and actions. We give you thanks for your abiding forbearance as promised in Christ, as we do for the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen.
license for that or no not oh. okay. I suppose. Don't let it be taken from you either to bride me. First scripture lesson today for this uh, second Sunday in Easter is from the book of Acts, which is um, Luke's uh, look at the early church. Um, but uh, Luke uh, was many, many decades after the early church. Uh, but this, uh, this is his view of it, of what he perceives the church was like. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and, the, and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And from the Gospel of John, the traditional reading, for the second Sunday in Easter. Uh, I'm just reading the beginning of it though, uh, not, the, uh, not the whole lesson. When it was evening on that day, which means the first Easter, this was Easter evening, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, um, this, this does not refer to all Jews because those of them behind the locked door were Jews also. Uh, this means the authorities, the temple authorities who had come after Jesus. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Here ends the scripture lessons for this second Sunday of Easter. May God add his blessing to our understanding. Amen. Traditionally, we do a lot of traditions today, traditionally the second Sunday in Easter, besides being low Sunday, what that meant in churches with big staffs was the senior pastor had off and the associate pastor had to work and, uh, and that as many people that were there on Easter were there the next Sunday. So, just so you know. But anyway, the other tradition for this Sunday was that the story of Doubting Thomas is always read. Well, I am sorry to tell you for those of you who were in great anticipation of once more hearing the story of Doubting Thomas, you will have to wait another year to hear about Doubting Thomas. We're going to take a little break from the story and uh, hopefully plunge into it next year, or I find something else to preach on, and uh, find out there's always much to learn from Thomas. 
luckily for us, both the lessons that were read today do give us helpful information about what it means to live as God's resurrection people. That's who we are. We live our lives on this side of the resurrection. Uh, even though we might only celebrate Easter once a year, we are always on this side of Easter. God's resurrection people. Paul, who predates both the story we read in Acts and the story we read uh, from John, certainly talks about the primary concern for the early church. And that was, how do you be, how are you to be as a Christian when no one else has lived life as a Christian? That's what Paul went around and did when he formed churches. This is how you are a Christian, Paul taught. But the only example anybody had was Paul. So he laid down the groundwork in each of his churches, sometimes for a long time, Sometimes not long because he got driven out of town on a rail. It makes perfect sense to think that was the issue that concerned the early church. As I said, no one had ever been a Christian before. So how do you navigate life as one of God's resurrected, resurrection people? How do you navigate life as part of God's resurrected community? Now, it wasn't like people didn't have communities then. There were all kinds of gods people worship. I'm sure there was a Masonic Lodge somewhere. You know, there were all kinds of groups that people belonged to. And they knew how to do that. But how are they supposed to do that as Christians, as individuals, and in community with one another? Both Acts and John wrote later than Paul, the end of the first century, and that remained a concern for those who followed Christ. You see, Jesus was supposed to come again immediately, like next Tuesday. And when he didn't, things got a little harder. And as time went by, it got more and more difficult to figure out, okay, this is how we live if we're waiting for Jesus to come right now. But how do we live if it doesn't seem he's coming for a while? As a matter of fact, that is still the concern of the church. Anyway, it should be. How are we to remain faithful since we believe that Jesus is coming again? But how to remain faithful to his call that has come down to us through the centuries? How do we live like we really, truly believe that Christ has been raised from the grave and has given each of us, here and out there, the possibility of living a resurrected life. And maybe I thought when I was writing the sermon at this point I should just go back and, and go with Thomas because that seemed easier, but I thought, no, we'll just plow through it. 
The Gospel of John, though it was written much longer afterwards, keeps us in Easter, the evening of the first Easter. According to John, Mary Magdalene has seen the risen Christ. She has run to the disciples and told them, I have seen Jesus. The beloved disciple, who we're not real clear who he was, ran to the tomb and saw the empty tomb. And he too came back and said, Jesus is risen. Well, that evening, as the day was coming to an end, where do we find the disciples? And this could have been not just the 11, well, the 10, because Thomas isn't there, but it could have been a lot of other people who had also believed in Jesus. Where were they? They were in a room behind locked doors for a couple of reasons. One was they were afraid that if uh, the Jewish authorities uh, in with the Romans had crucified Christ, maybe those who had followed Christ were next, which was a, you know, a pretty good thing to think might happen. And the other thing that is obvious is they are afraid. And they have not believed the declarations that Christ has been raised from the dead. So they sit there behind locked doors hoping nothing happens to them. Except, of course, it does. In the midst of them, through the locked doors, Jesus appears. Peace be with you, Jesus declares to them, and he shows them his wounds. And they are delighted, not in the wounds, but because Jesus is there. And then declares to them again, peace be with you. And then sends them out to serve as he had been sent out to serve. But in the Gospel of John, because John does not, John does not separate events out like the other Gospel writers do. This happens this day, this for John, it is one total reality. Um, Jesus is crucified, Jesus is raised, and Jesus shares the Holy Spirit. So in the Gospel of John, the disciples are given the Holy Spirit on the night of Easter. There is no separate Pentecost story in John. It all happens in one day. This time, though, the story in John is very reminiscent, not of the story we find in Acts, but of the story we find in the book of Genesis, when Jesus breathes life into his creation. And that's what he does to that community that has gathered. He has given them life by his very breath. However we imagine our new lives in Christ, which I have said I think a thousand times, is not an easy life. It is a, uh, it can be difficult, it can be extraordinary, it, it makes us face things we may not want to face, do things we do not want to do. The assurance in John is 
that we never take on this new resurrected life alone. The Holy Spirit becomes and is the support, encouragement, empowerment from the very beginning for those who would be Christ's resurrection people. However we choose to live out that resurrected life, and you know, we're all called to different aspects of that. We don't all live in the light of the resurrection the same way. That would be boring. We don't do it alone. We get help along the way. If we are willing to open ourselves to it, if we are willing to accept what God and Christ have given us in the Holy Spirit, if we're willing to say, well, I really don't know all of it, and I'm going to really need some guidance in this, and the Holy Spirit helps, helps in many ways, through many people, you'd be surprised the way the Holy Spirit has come to me sometimes in my life to help me understand what I have to do and be. Which is really a good thing. Because, as I said, the resurrected life is no easy thing to do. And so to know that we do not make that journey alone is very assuring. In the book of Acts, and particularly in Acts 4 that we read from today, Luke gives us a very idealized version of the church. Now, I'm not sure you all like this description of the church. Uh, a lot of people don't. Um, there were no private possessions. Um, all the resources that people had were sold and held in common. Everything was turned over to the apostles to be distributed to those who were in need. I, I'm sorry, I, it, it's almost like a form of communism and it's all purity. Most people don't like that. And the reality of it is it probably wasn't like that <laughs> because People really have never chosen uh, to live that way, at least uh, not for long periods of time. But it is important that Luke shares those things with us because they do say something about the early church. Things were not hunky dory. All you got to do is read the letters of Paul or the whole book of Acts which is wrong, but read the whole book of Acts in the passage from today. Uh, if I had read on, we would have read about two people, Ananias and Sapphira. I don't know if you've ever read this story, but anyway, they are members of the early church. And like other people, they sold their property and gave the money to Peter. Except they didn't give him all of it. They kept some back for themselves. And then they both dropped that. That's never an election or any of that story, but it's pretty much a lesson a way that uh, things got dealt with in the early church. 
But we can't look at ads and say, well, they weren't perfect, so we're not going to read it. We cannot sacrifice the good for the perfect. The early church was not perfect. And that's probably good because we aren't either. But there are a couple of things that Luke teaches us or gives us to look at in the Acts that do help on how we live together. First of all, the church attempted, attempted over and over and over again to have unity in the midst of diversity. Now, most of the church people in, in the church were poor, had almost nothing, but not all of them. There were some really wealthy people in the church, and also there were people who came from other parts of the world who were in the church. And that caused problems. Just read the book of Corinthians. And while the church began as Galilean Jews, the fishermen, it didn't stay that way for long. And the church had to deal with a lot of controversies. As a matter of fact, it could have killed the church in its first decade. If once in a while, Someone didn't say, okay, we're not exactly like them. We don't come from where they come from, and we may not carry out the faith the way they do. But they're Christians, and we have our commonality there in Christ. So what if we're not all the same? If we all believe in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the church worked very hard to be generous in the midst of poverty. This has never, ever changed. If we haven't figured out by this time that it has always been a major concern for those who follow God in Christ, as a matter of fact, a major concern throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testament, it is the ultimate ministry is to those who do not have. Both in the Old and New Testament. That those of us who have, even as little as it might be at times, are to share that with others. And I'm not talking here about giving out some meals which is a good thing to do, or throwing some money at a problem, which is also a good thing to do. This means our entire lives are spent working for a greater community that works for all people. When there is oppression and intolerance, when we allow our children to go to bed hungry, and they are our children, are they not? All of them? Anywhere in the world? They are ours? If we allow them to be misused, to be sold, if we do not want to live in a world where all are treated fairly in our abundance, well, 
then we've kind of missed the point of why we have been called together in the first place. We are one people. We do not look alike, we do not talk alike, we do not worship alike, but at our very basic point is Jesus Christ. Everything else is just fluff we put on it. That is what matters. And how the church has decided from its very beginning that at that very basis is the care for those who do not have sometimes nothing. That is how we are to live. And we all do it differently. Every community does it differently. And that's okay. Just so we all do it. Just like those in the early church, I have no idea when Jesus is coming a bit back again. I wish I did. I'd sell tickets. But if we do not remain Christ's resurrection people, to be as he has called us to be, at least if we don't try, then who do we think is going to do it? That always fascinates me. If we don't want to do it, if the church doesn't want to do it, if the community of faith says, oh, but we have other things, and we have to survive, and we can't do that because people will get mad, or we can't do this because so-and-so will be unhappy. Then who do we think in the sand hill is going to do any of this? Who's going to care for our children and our elders and our hospitalized and our sick? Who's going to do that if we don't? At least it won't be done with the heart and the soul and the power God gives us in the Holy Spirit, which is how we are called to have it done. Now, I know poor Thomas got left out today. I'll apologize to him later. But I think he would have agreed that this was a lot of good stuff. Amen. Oh, we will give our second hymn and we get to sit down for that.
we are not um, that we are not collecting offering anymore in terms of, of ushers and everything. Uh, but I did want to explain that the offering is in a different spot. Did you notice? Oh, good. Thanks. Somebody did. I was going to put it in red and see if anybody noticed. Um, anyway, for the near future, uh, the offering will be after the sermon. Uh, in the early church, early, early, early church, um, the offering, whatever it was, um, was whether it was money or whether it was the communion elements, whatever it was, always came after the sermon because the offering is always a response to the Word of God. So, um, I guess for a while anyway, I would like to keep the offering here. I know it's different. Um, but um, I think we can handle it. So, um, and I also think we need to continually give thanks to God. So let us pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for light and life and love, and above all, the presence of the living Lord among us. By your spirit who breathes within us, strengthen our faith, use our gifts, and work in our lives to bear witness to the resurrection of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And if you would now stand for the closing hymn.
when Bill sits right in front, then I know how to sing it, because he <laughs> sings loud. So I think from now on, for the last 10, Bill's going to have to stand up here and sing in the mic. Right? All right. That's the only way I know if I don't know him, is when you sing him. That's great. Well, that's, I like, wow, I like that. We can sing that again. We'll make it Easter some other time. <laughs> coming this week, <laughs> and, uh, and I appreciate that, and uh, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome. Please don't forget the annual meeting next week. I know they're, they're like, you're sitting there thinking, boring, uh, and I know that. I can't even count the number of annual meetings I've gone to. Church, it's Sam, I don't know every year. Uh, but we're in a, we're in a really um, interesting time as a community of faith. And uh, as many people as possible need to be involved uh, both in making the decisions and in having their say and being in community with one another. Because uh, that's the only way we figure out what we want to do or where we want to go or how we want to get there. So, um, you know, you could bring a word puzzle for the room. Like, when I have to get up and talk, you know, the puzzle and do that. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's okay. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay, next week, louder. <laughs> I'm going to